morning everybody okay, we were talking in the last class about the heat evolution patterns produced by isothermal and adiabatic calorimeters and you saw primarily that uh, each one of these calorimetry techniques had their own advantages can anybody recap the advantages for me advantage of isothermal calorimetry over adiabatic calorimetry what is the advantage you can measure the heat evolution right from the time zero yeah and what else it's more accurate because we are actually measuring the heat directly okay in the case of adiabatic calorimetry we are measuring the temperature and converting that to the heat okay what else assumptions are need not be made for isothermal. isothermal you don't need to have specific assumptions related to the heat properties of different ingredients correct what about adiabatic calorimetry what are the advantages we can have a very large sample size you can have the actual concrete you can actually test the exact concrete mix that we are intending to use in the job site so that we can actually get to know what is the potential temperature rise that we can expect in the system correct okay now especially in the presence of pozzolanic materials the study of heat evolution can help us analyze the reactivity characteristics of the pozzolans quite nicely and uh, i was telling you with slag uh, and fly ash you cause some changes to the heat pattern primarily with fly ash the peak temperature as well as the peak heat rate are considerably reduced when fly ash is used especially in larger levels of replacement of cement by fly ash okay now the same is not true for type c fly ash where you may see some delay in achieving the peak heat rate but overall peak heat rate is not that much different as compared to the original cement so you see here the data for type c fly ash at 20 and 30% replacement seems to indicate that it's almost similar to cement now when portland porcelain cement is produced what type of fly ash is used is is it type f or type c f right f f type f will be more okay now again it just depends on the availability what fly ash is available in the vicinity of the cement plant fly uh, uh, if you have type c fly ash is available more than type f definitely that might get used in the production of portland porcelain cement now as a result of this the quality and the characteristics of the ppc that you obtain may have some variation because of the type of fly ash that you actually have as you saw here in this heat pattern itself when you have type f fly ash as a cement replacement you actually see a reduction in the peak heat rate whereas if you have type c fly ash there's no major change and the kind of characteristics exhibited by this concrete in terms of long term strength and durability also may be quite different when you are talking about type f versus type c so in a cement company they'll obviously make do with whatever is available for the least cost right but sometimes they also get a variety of fly ashes from different locations and based on the quantities needed they may actually need to blend some of these fly ashes together so it's often a big uh, challenge for cement companies to maintain the kind of chemical and physical characteristics that you need in a fly ash or in a blended cement when you have fly ashes coming from so, so many different places in fact uh, in certain parts uh, of the country uh, for example where you have thermal power plants where you don't have sources of coal like north chennai right north chennai has uh, a few thermal power plants but there's no sources of coal there so coal is obtained from different locations within india and sometimes imported from outside the country also like places like indonesia we get a lot of coal from there and this coal when you burn it can give quite different characteristics with respect to the fly ash that is generated and in fact uh, we had some queries from uh, people from the north chennai thermal power station that sometimes they were receiving fly ashes from indonesia that were producing uh, receiving coal from indonesia that was actually producing a uh, red or pink colored fly ash so slightly different lot of impurities were there and it had lot of calcium based impurities also because of which the characteristic could have changed from type f to type c so reactivity color all this varies quite a bit depending on where you get the fly ash from okay anyway fly ash is something we'll discuss in detail later but for slag it's also been reported that sometimes you may actually get uh, an additional peak for the slag heat evolu uh, evolution pattern you may get an additional peak that relates to the reaction of the slag itself and that's especially seen when the slag is very reactive in most cases slag reacts much slower than cement so it may need a lot more time for the reaction to really initiate right but in some cases when the slag is reactive you may actually see this secondary peak which is associated with the slag reaction now slag what does it contain it contains the same sort of oxides as cement calcium oxide silicon dioxide aluminum oxide and iron oxide okay but then there are some combined phases calcium silicate calcium uh, magnesium silicate phases and so on which are not as reactive there are very finely graded silica particles in slag which could be reactive and produce that 
high heat peak very early in the sta uh, hydration stages. Okay. So, this may or may not be observed when you use pozzolanic materials, but what you will observe in some cases is the presence of an additional peak which is barely discernible in this case of a heat evolution pattern comparing different types of cement blending materials. Okay. So, again uh, here you can see that the secondary peak that is seen which is barely seen as a hump in the case of ordinary Portland cement which is the black line. The other curves are showing a slightly bigger peak. Okay. The other curves which are indicating a replacement of cement by other blending materials like quartz, fly ash and slag, you are seeing a slightly higher peak there and that is basically related to the aluminates. Okay. That is called the aluminate peak. So, if you were to differentiate this uh, heat evolution pattern into two parts, you would say that this primary peak is the silicate peak and the secondary peak that appears after the uh, silicate peak is the aluminate peak. Now, I told you earlier that cement has to be proportioned carefully. You need to use the right amount of sulphate in the system. So, what happens is if you have excess sulphate in the system or if you have too much sulphate in the system, this aluminate peak may start occurring at a time which is even sometimes before the silicate peak. Now, the silicate is, uh, peak is very crucial for you to get the right level of early strength attainment. Okay. If you do not have that early silicate peak, you will have a problem with attaining the right levels of strength in your system. So, you need to proportion the gypsum in such a way that this aluminate peak always follows the silicate peak. Now, this can become a concern only in the case of extremely reactive pozzolanic systems that have aluminates in them. Can you name one such reactive system? pozzolanic system that may have aluminate. Fly ash has aluminates, but maybe it is not that reactive. Which pozzolan will give you a highly reactive aluminate system? Clay. clay. Yeah. Calcine clay will give you a highly reactive aluminate system. So, in that case you need to be extra careful that you have proportioned your sulphate well enough. So, that this aluminate peak always follows the silicate peak. So, that you get your normal strength attainment because of hydration of silicates. Okay. Now, again uh, this uh, heat evolution pattern on the left again captures the effect of replacement by fly ash, okay, type F fly ash. So, you see here that compared to OPC which is at the top, the peak heat rate is significantly reduced. Okay. The duration of the dormant period also seems to be reduced or sorry increased when fly ash is used as a cement replacement. Okay. Dormant period duration is increased that means it will take more time for the cement to actually set when you have fly ash as a cement replacement. Okay, again, this is just uh, showing a magnified view of the same image that was produced on the left. So, here you can actually see that the kickoff of the hydration is happening much faster for OPC and slower when fly ash is used as a replacement for the cement. So, again, we discussed briefly yesterday uh, about the reasons why the dormant period actually happens. Apart from the theory that there is a barrier of hydration products around the cement, there can be other possible explanation also. One is increased ionic strength around the particle okay? because you know that when the cement particle is put in water, there is immediate dissolution from the surface and that increase, increases the ionic concentration around the particle. And because of this obviously, the penetration of water to react or interact with the remaining part of unhydrated cement may get difficult because ionic strength around will also act like a barrier. So, you have to overcome this barrier to actually react with the cement that is inside. Okay? So, the barrier layer is probably the theory which is most agreed upon by researchers and that seems to agree well with the kind of uh, changes that happen when we replace cementitious systems with other blending materials. Okay. So, end of the dormant period occurs when the barrier gets weakened by aging. Okay. In a long, long period of time, let us say 3 to 4 hours, you slowly have this barrier breaking because it is already a very thin membrane. Okay. Uh, the rate of diffusion of water through the barrier increases to a level that is high enough to start causing the reaction with the cement and the ionic strength around the hydrating particles is reducing because again you are starting to form the precipitates. Okay. For example, if you have calcium ions coming out from the particle, you may start precipitating calcium hydroxide. That means the ionic strength will reduce, you will start forming more solid precipitates. As a result of this, there is easier entry of water towards the location of the unhydrated cement. Okay. So, this seems to indicate a specific mechanism of interaction of the cement with water. So, you have your cement particle, right? the first stage of interaction obviously relates to the 
dissolution of cement particles or cement uh, ions from the cement particle outwards. There is some dissolution outwards. But then I said later you have water diffusing through this initial hydrate layer that is forming on the surface. Water actually then diffuses inside and then interacts with the particle in its given location. Okay. So, I will come back to this phenomenon later when we discuss about what is the structure of the hydrated products especially the structure of the CSH and you can quite easily distinguish that this there is a CSH that forms outside the cement grain that is called outer CSH and the CSH that actually forms inside the cement grain that is called inner CSH and that is exactly because of the nature of the hydration process. For a start hydration happens because of dissolution and then later it happens because of inward diffusion of water and subsequent hydration in situ. Okay. So, we will talk about that once again when we get to the structure of the CSH. So, let us now look at the overall uh, reactions. What are the reactions that take place in the system? We know that silicates that is C3S and C2S will react directly with water to produce CSH calcium silicate hydrate. You know very well that CSH is the primary binding component of cement paste okay. and it also produces calcium hydroxide. Now, I will show you the stoichiometry of this reaction later for an easy purpose we can actually have a nicely balanced reaction, but that is not the exact reaction. Nevertheless, you will see that from that reaction three times as much calcium hydroxide is formed by C3S hydration as compared to C2S hydration. So, there is lot more calcium hydroxide formed when C3S hydrates. In a normal Portland cement you know that there is lot more C3S than C2S. So, you can expect that substantially large amounts of calcium hydroxide will also form upon hydration after C3S reacts with water. Now, calcium silicate hydrate, why do you think we give it a name like that CSH? C you know is calcium oxide, S is silicon dioxide, H is H2O or water or water of hydration, right? It is not hydrogen, it is water. H is water and cement chemist notation. So, CSH calcium silicate hydrate is just a common terminology given to this gel like substance that is actually forming. Now, gel does not mean it is a colloid, it is got a got an appearance with a very high surface area that resembles that of colloids. It is not really a colloid, it is a solid, but it resembles a colloidal appearance because of which it is called a gel. Okay. Then we say CSH because we have no exact identification of the exact amount of C, exact am amount of S and exact amount of H in the structure of CSH. So, that is why we call it loosely as CSH. I will see, I will uh, show a little bit more on the structure later, but in general the calcium to silica ratio in CSH varies between 1.5 and 2. More typically it is around 1.8, the typical ratio is around 1.8. Okay. The other components that is the aluminates in the absence of gypsum, okay, you know that gypsum has to be present otherwise aluminates can re rapidly react to form calcium aluminate hydrate. Okay. Now, we do not we do not have this situation in normal cement because we do have gypsum because of which the reaction actually leads to the formation of a compound called ettringite which is also written as AFT. Okay. Now, what is A? Aluminate F is ferrite Fe2O3 and T is, is basically the trisulphate phase, trisulphate. Okay. That means there are three sulphates in the ettringite. Okay. And this ettringite can convert later to what is called monosulphate, where AF is the same aluminoferrite and M is monosulphate. Now, why this happens, we will take a look at in just a minute. Okay. That depends a lot on the amount of aluminate and sulphate that is actually available in your system. Right. And uh, the ettringite that forms from the reaction of C3A with gypsum is known to be expansive. There are numerous mechanisms of expansion. I will show you later the structure of ettringite and then relate the expansions. But in early hydration, we are not worried about any expansion because the cement is still plastic, right? It is still moldable. So, any expansion that happens in the system is not really going to cause damage in the concrete. Only when this expansion happens when the concrete is hardened, in that case we will get damage in the concrete. Okay. At in the fresh state, the paste is able to take up these expansive stresses. So, you do not really have a problem with the expansion of ettringite. Okay, so, specifics of the reaction, these are only 
approximate reactions, they are not the exact reactions, they are written from the purpose of solving stoichiometrically the equations, that is all. So, you have 2 C 3 S plus 6 waters of hydration giving you C 3 S 2 H 3 plus 3 C H. So, again here it seems to indicate that calcium to silica ratio is 1.5 which may or may not be the case, okay. This is just written in, in a way so that we can have a nicely balanced reaction, okay. So, sometimes people use uh, instead of 3 and 2 they use X and Y for the C and H S, okay. So, th this is not an exact reaction but it is written because it can nicely be balanced. Similarly, with C2S when it reacts with water you form CSH once again and calcium hydroxide and based on this reaction you can see that you form 3 times as much calcium hydroxide with C3S as you do with C2S. So, there is a lot more calcium hydroxide generation with C3S, okay. The aluminate reaction is called a flash set reaction because your cement sets rapidly with a very high evolution of heat in the absence of gypsum, okay. And so, you have aluminate plus water giving you two different forms of calcium aluminate hydrate, okay, two different forms of calcium aluminate hydrate. Now, this these phases that form because of aluminate hydration are metastable phases. That means, they would not remain in that same structure for a long time. So, there is a reorganization that actually happens and then the system gets converted to C 3 A H 6, especially when the temperature is high. By high, I mean over 25 degrees Celsius that is good enough to actually start causing a change in the structure of these cements to a slightly different crystal structure. Now, it is an interesting phenomenon uh, with alumina, uh, I mean uh, with the aluminate phases because with the change in the crystal structure there is also a major change in the kind of hydration products that form, in the kind of uh, structure of the hydration products that actually forms. Now, you know very well that there are special classes of cements which we call as high aluminate cements, right? High, high alumina cement. It is also called a calcium aluminate cement because in that case the primary compound that is present in the high alumina cement is calcium aluminate C A. And like cement is pro, uh, produced from a mixture of limestone and clay, the high alumina cement or calcium aluminate cement is produced from a mixture of limestone and alumina from where, where do you get alumina from? No, not clay where is the source of alumina, pure pure alumina, bauxite, yeah. So, limestone and bauxite are the ingredients for the formation of calcium aluminate cement. Now, again with calcium aluminate cement, you will get these metastable phases when the calcium aluminate cement reacts with water and these metastable phases will later convert to more stable hydrate phases. Interestingly, what happens when this conversion occurs is that the porosity of the system increases several orders of magnitude, okay several times. If you have a certain porosity with the metastable phases, that porosity undergoes a major increase when it changes to the other forms of hydrate. So, now what happens? What do you think will happen to the system? The strength will decline, okay. Now, calcium aluminate cements came into prominence especially after the second world war. In Germany, when they, when they were trying to reconstruct the cities, they wanted to use concrete that could be put into service very early because of that they started using calcium aluminate cements for their concrete construction and the strengths attained initially were excellent. But after about 15, 20 years of service, many of these buildings started collapsing because the concrete strengths had really drastically reduced. You can have a reduction in strength from all the way up, up, uh, up, up at about 80 megapascals down to less than 20 megapascals. You can have such drastic reduction in strength because of the change in the hydrated product structure of the cement. Okay, so, most of these buildings started collapsing and because of that calcium aluminate cement started going out of favor with the construction industry. And now calcium aluminate cements are only used for very specific applications because they are very good at extremely high temperatures. When you are talking about 1000 degrees and so on which are inside the cement kiln for, for example, for doing the lining of the cement kiln you will probably use something like a calcium aluminate cement because at that temperature the phases that are formed are excellent with respect to their heat resistant properties, okay. So, with for general purpose construction, this is not a good idea to use calcium aluminate cement primarily because it leads to a reduction in performance or strength and durability reduction with the passage of time, especially at moderate to elevated temperatures. I mean elevated, I mean up to about 25 to 30 degrees Celsius, okay. If your temperature is always very low, less than 15, mostly these cements would not undergo this kind of a change. But if your temperatures reach normal working temperatures of 20, 25, 30, 
you can see this change in the hydrated structure happening which leads to an overall reduction in the quality of the cement ok. But we do not have to worry about this in conventional cements because we know that in conventional cements the aluminate will first react with gypsum and not with the water ok. So, aluminate with gypsum leads to the formation of this compound called ettringite. What I want you to notice of course, there are 3 sulphates in the ettringite ok. Please remember this is S with a bar ok. Typically this is S with a bar on top. Unfortunately, I was not able to find the uh, correct expression for that in PowerPoint. So, I put S with a bar at the bottom. So, underlined S ok and 3 sulphates important thing to understand is 32 molecules of water of hydration bound water content. So, this 32 molecules of water are bound in the structure of the ettringite. So, very high bound water content is there in the ettringite. So, when you produce ettringite and you heat it up to a certain temperature the loss of that bound water will lead to a very large change in mass ok. Uh, for those of you who will learn thermal analysis later you will learn that thermal analysis deals with the change in the structure of different components when you heat them. So, especially ettringite when you heat it about 100 and uh, 105 degrees Celsius or about 90 to 105 degrees Celsius you will remove this bound water content of 32 uh, molecules of water because of which you will see a massive mass change happening at that temperature which corresponds to the ettringite in the system. Okay. Now, anyway this trisulphate phase is what appears first this ettringite forms first because of the reaction of C 3 A and gypsum. Now, how much C 3 A do we have in our system typically about 8 percent yeah on the on the average about 8 7 to 8 percent in Indian cements. If you go abroad uh, to the US or U, uh, Europe your cements will have close to 10 11 percent C 3 A the ordinary Portland cements will have very high C 3 A levels. So, we have around 8 percent C 3 A and how much is gypsum about 3 to 4 percent we are talking about about 4 percent of gypsum right. So, there is always an excess of aluminate present you have less of gypsum there is an excess of aluminate. So, this reaction will not be the end product of the reaction of aluminate and sulphate you may have a further reaction that actually takes place because the sulphates have already been consumed and there is still aluminate that wants to react because of that this phase will then get transformed into something called monosulphate ok. So, all sulphate gets combined to form ettringite an ordinary portion cement. So, there is excess aluminate which is still left in the system it reacts with this ettringite to form monosulphate and which has a stoichiometry of 1 sulphate ok. In ettringite there were 3 sulphates in mono, monosulphate there is 1 sulphate and there is lesser water of hydration 12 to 18 I am sorry that this went to the next line it is 12 to 18 molecules of water of hydration in the case of monosulphate. Now, interestingly this change also changes the structure of the crystalline products that actually forms ok. I will show you later the structure of ettringite it forms ettringite typically typically appears as needles ok and then it changes to platelets of monosulphate. So, there is a change from ettringite to monosulphate in the crystal structure also. Now, if there is sufficient excess aluminate still left even after formation of monosulphate then it reacts with water and starts forming calcium aluminate hydrates ok. Mostly what happens is uh, you do not form very large crystals of these aluminate hydrates because already your C 3 A crystals are extremely fine in size because of which you will find that at a very uh, micro molecular scale you will find these aluminates mixed with the A F M phases A F M is your monosulphate phase right. So, the aluminophorite hydrates that actually forms with water will be found to be intermixed with the A F M phases within the, the structure of your hydrated cement paste. I will show you this later the structure can be seen with different types of hydration products. Now, when you have ferrite or calcium aluminophorite the reaction is quite similar to what you have with C 3 A except that part of the alumina is replaced by iron in the structure of ettringite or monosulphate part of the alumina is replaced by iron and you form iron substituted ettringite or iron substituted monosulphate. We discussed earlier that for different types of cement you need to maintain a balance between the C 3 A and C 4 A F contents right. When C 3 A is low automatically C 4 A F will be high right and C 4 A F I told you by and large it is a non reactive phase because iron bringing it to solution 
takes an inordinately long time. So, you cannot really get good reactions with the C4AF anyway. So, higher the ratio of C4AF to C3A, lower is the conversion of ettringite to monosulphate. Now, I presented some facts here. I said ettringite formation is known to be expansive, right. In fresh cement paste, that expansion does not cause any problem because fresh cement paste is still plastic and moldable. It can take care of that expansion, okay. In fresh cement paste, this ettringite is not a stable phase that converts to monosulphate, right. It converts to monosulphate. In ordinary Portland cement, monosulphate is a stable phase. Now, what happens when the cement gets hardened and then is exposed to an external sulphate solution? When you have external sulphates attacking the cement paste which is hardened now, what will happen? No, you already have monosulphate as a stable phase. And you may still have some unreacted C3A also left in the system. Not all of it will react all the time, but you may have either C3A or mostly monosulphate plus C4AH13 or other calcium aluminate hydrate products. So, when you expose these to external sulphates, what will happen? Again, ettringite will form. So, this monosulphate will reconvert to ettringite in external sulphate attack. So, when you have sulphates from an outside source coming into your cement, it will convert the monosulphate back to ettringite. And this is happening when the cement is hard or cement paste is hardened, right. So, that will be accompanied by volume changes that will cause yes. cracking in the system, right, cracking in the system. So, volume changes cannot be accommodated by hardened concrete because of which it will start cracking. So, this reconversion happens from monosulphate to ettringite in the case of an external sulphate attack. Okay. So, now we saw earlier that for sulphate resistant cements, we keep the C3A content very low, 0 to 4 percent. If you remember the standards, C3A content of sulphate resistant cement is 0 to 4 percent. So, what will happen in that case? There will be probably very little monosulphate. It is possible that your ettringite may be a stable phase at the end of the hydration itself. And you would not have excess monosulphate available that can further react with, C, uh, with sulphate from external sources to reform ettringite in a hardened cement paste. So, in a sulphate resistant cement, you have very little conversion of ettringite to monosulphate. So, in other words, ettringite is a stable phase that forms in <coughs> sulphate resistant cement. Okay? So, keep that in mind that the premise of making cement sulphate resistant is primarily to prevent the reformation of ettringite in the hardened stages. But I will tell you later that that is only solving part of the problem. There is also another problem with sulphate attack, which we will discuss later in more detail when we talk about durability. Okay, again, uh, with respect to heat evolution patterns, you can again study these aluminate reactions. So, appropriate sulphate content, I told you that you need to optimize sulphate in your system, so that this aluminate reaction occurs just after your silicate reaction and happens early enough to produce a good early strength. Okay? So, you want to optimize your cements to get the right early strengths, but at the same time you want to have it in such a way that the silicate reactions happen first followed by the aluminate reaction. So, here you have different systems on the left, you have OPC. Okay? In OPC you can see that there is a very broad peak here, it is possible that some of the aluminate reactions are getting overlapped in the silica reactions itself. Now, when you start replacing OPC with uh, components that may have reactive aluminates, you may start picking up this distinct reaction peak. Okay. Now, you have three different systems, one is with type F fly ash, okay, which is not really pr producing a aluminate peak which can be very clearly noticed. With type C fly ash, after the silicate peak, you are able to see some al aluminate peak also. Okay. And with the LC3 system, which is basically a mixture of uh, cement plus limestone plus calcined clay. because of the highly reactive alumina contributed by the calcine clay, these aluminate reactions can have a substantially high rate of reactivity, okay? because of which you see that peak aluminate peak is much higher in terms of the actual rate of heat evolution even compared to the silicate peak that is happening because of the clinker reaction. Okay? 
So you need to choose your amount of substitution of clinker and the reactivity of the substitute material in a careful manner so that the silicate reactions from the clinker happen first followed by the eliminate reactions that can be contributed by the pozzolanic material. Now what we found was interestingly, I am not presenting the result here, with some of the LC3 cements, when you are raising the initial temperature of hydration, what ended up happening was the aluminate reaction was accelerated so much that it happened even before the silicate reaction. And as a result of that, we did not get a proper strength development in those mixes. Okay? So you need to have a good control by optimizing your sulphate in such a way that this aluminate reaction takes place after the silicates have really started. Okay? And again here this is a, a picture of a, a test where we had to do optimization of the gypsum concentration. Okay? So here again we have different systems of LC3 with different amounts of additional gypsum over and above what is present in the cement. Right? So you, here you have 3 percent, this is 2 percent and that is 1 percent gypsum. So the idea is you want to push this aluminate peak slightly away from the silicate peak to ensure that you get proper strength development. So you might optimize it towards this 2 percent gypsum rather than 1 percent because there you are really too close to the silicate peak. Okay? So appropriate sulphate ensures that the aluminate reaction occurs just after the major silicate reaction peak and once gypsum is depleted, your excess aluminates will start forming. AFM just like we talked in the last slide. Okay. Now I should also add here, although I will discuss this later when we talk about LC3 specifically, that since limestone is also contributing carbonate, is also contributing carbonate, this AFM phases need not be only restricted to monosulphate, you can also get a phase called monocarbonate <coughs> with the LC3 system. So that is an additional hydration product that you actually form with the LC3 system. Again, I will touch upon this in more detail in a later chapter. So to put all this in perspective, let us look at how the cement paste actually evolves. So I would like you to pay attention first to the bottom left, again which shows you a picture of cement particles in water. Okay? So you have these cement particles in water and you also see some well formed crystals very early within the dormant period. So this is actually the picture taken during the dormant period. Okay? What is happening in this dormant period? You have the barrier layer of hydrates present on the cement particles which you can see with the needle like substances on the cement particles. Okay. You also have some well defined crystalline materials that are formed away from the cement particles that is because calcium that is coming out is able to form calcium hydroxide. So you form these hexagonal crystals of calcium hydroxide may be slightly away from the cement particles. Okay. So that is your dormant period where your reaction is proceeding at a very slow rate. Towards setting, as I had indicated in the previous class, you start forming sufficient barrier, uh, sufficient hydrate that you have a network of hydrated products throughout your system. Do, you do not have too much free water available in the system. Okay? So this network of hydrates is enabling the setting of your cement to take place. When we go from setting to hardening, what it means is most of the free water that is present in a system is starting to get consumed to form the hydrated cement phases and you form a more densely packed structure at about one day you have lot of open porosity by 7 days and 28 days most of the porosity have started getting closed and your hydrated structure is properly developed in your system. Now this representation is quite nice because it also helps us understand the effect of the water to cement ratio. So just like we discussed earlier, when you have lesser water cement ratio, the, in the same volume you have more cement particles because of which filling up the gaps between these particles becomes easier. In other words, you will start attaining your strength and durability much faster. Okay? But what about the extent of hydration? What about the extent of hydration? Will it be greater at low water cement ratio or lower? Will the extent of hydration be greater at lower water cement ratio or will it be lower than higher water cement ratio? What is the extent of hydration? How much of the cement actually has reacted with the water? 
So when you lower the water cement ratio, what will happen to the degree of hydration? What happens? It's quite obvious, no? From looking at this diagram, when you lower the water cement ratio, a degree of hydration also should be lowered. But we all know that when you lower the water cement ratio, the strength is increased. So, is hydration not necessary for strength? Hydration is necessary, but close packing is uh, okay. So, strength means extent of solid material that is present in your system. That means the reduction in porosity of the system. Okay. We need to have sufficient hydration to ensure that the porosity gets sealed properly, but we do not want all of our cement particles to react because it is first of all physically not possible. Secondly, these particles even if they do not react still function as fillers. They are still blocking the empty spaces in the concrete because of which at low water cement ratio you are automatically getting a higher strength even though your degree of hydration may be much lower. Okay. So, if there is more water available, there will be more hydration. But at low water cement ratio, you do not get as much hydration. At the same time, you get higher strength development because you are blocking all the pores effectively. Okay. There are other issues which are related to this discussion which we will discuss later anyway. So, if you see… Unreacted particles of cement. Yes. No, see the unreacted particles do not affect durability because they again as you rightly said they are unreacted. They are just sitting there the system blocking the pores, reducing the inter interconnectivity of the pores and they are not participating directly in any reactions that happen later. later no, they, they, they may not because the amount of work it would take to for any water or aggressive chemicals to get to the unreacted particles may be substantial because it has to make its way through a densely populated uh, barrier of hydrated cement products. So, the presence of these unhydrated particles is not going to affect durability. Okay, so, the durability we will talk later is again primarily a function of the interconnectivity of the porosity that is there in the system. So, the higher the water, the more interconnected the pores, lower the water, the lesser interconnected the pores. That is why we get better durability at lower water to cement ratios. Okay, again, we will we'll have enough discussion on that. So, here if you see the evolution of the hydration products. So, we know that your initial hydration which happens within a few minutes will maybe form some calcium hydroxide because of the quick dissolution from the surface of the cement particles and maybe some early CSH also, but it is not really large enough to show here. It may also form some etringite, this black line here which goes up and comes down is ettringite. So, there is initial eliminate reaction, initial silicate reaction that may lead to the formation of calcium hydroxide and ettringite. In the dormant period, you do not really have anything else that is forming, not in substantial quantities anyway. Okay. Now, at the end of the dormant period, you have the primary heat peak that is appearing that is because of the reaction of the silicates and that silicate reaction leads to a rapid rise in the CSH formation in the system. You see a rapid rise in the CSH formation. You also see a corresponding rise in the ettringite formation because the aluminates are also reacting at the same time. Your silicates and aluminates from the clinker are reacting to produce CSH. Of course, CSH means it is also producing calcium hydroxide as well as ettringite from the aluminates is getting produced. Now, beyond about 1 to 2 days, what is happening to the ettringite? it starts getting converted to monosulphate. So, the amount of ettringite starts coming down beyond 1 or 2 days and may end up close to 0 at higher hydration ages, but not necessarily close to 0. Sometimes you may still find ettringite remaining in the system, but because again a reaction is not just subject to the availability of the reactants. There are several other conditions that need to be satisfied for reactions to get completed. So, this ettringite monosulphate conversion need not be complete. Okay, some ettringite may still remain in the system. Okay. We will see later that especially when you do heat curing, there are all kinds of changes that you end up doing to the system, but we will talk about that once, uh, once we get there. So, once ettringite starts getting depleted, the monosulphate starts increasing. The other black line here is the monosulphate. So, the decrease in ettringite is compensated by the increase in monosulphate phase. And of course, with the appearance of the monosulphate, you will st also start the appearance of the 
calcium aluminate hydrate phases because there is always excess alumina available that will lead to the formation of aluminate hydrates. So, if you look at a long term the products that are present in your cement paste are <coughs> calcium hydrox uh, calcium silicate hydrate, calcium hydroxide, calcium aluminoferrite hydrates and monosulphate. So, these are the four primary phases that you will form at long term ok. Now, of course, this is not showing you the amount exactly to the right scale. Most of your cement will be calcium silicate hydrate, most of the cement paste will be calcium silicate hydrate. You form nearly 50, 60, sometimes 65 percent of volume of calcium silicate hydrate in the system, and you form nearly about 15 percent or so of calcium hydroxide. The remainder is your aluminate and monosulphate phases, ok. Now, as the reactions are happening to produce more and more hydrate hydration products, your porosity is obviously going down. Your porosity in the system gradually declines in the beginning and then rapidly declines during this period of quick hydration and then again the rate of decrease in porosity slows down as your hydration proceeds beyond 7 days, ok. In modern cements beyond 7 days we do not get substantial increases, ok. Most of our, most of our cements produce nearly uh, close to 90 percent of the 28 day strength at 7 days itself. In fact, today uh, when you have to do a mixed design for an M30 concrete, you will design it in such a way that you get 30 mega Pascals at 7 days, that is the kind of approach you would have ok, because you will see that between 7 and 28 days there is hardly about 5, 6 mega Pascals increase. So, when you do the design, the 7 day strength is approximately equal to the characteristic strength, that is a good guideline to use with the modern cements ok, because we have a very rapidly reacting cements today. Now, this is again uh, from a different textbook you see the same sort of a chart being shown, the reduction in ettringite and subsequent increase in the monosulphate phase, your st stable calcium silicate hydrate and calcium hydroxide phases at the end of the hydration period ok. Again just to give you what is the physical meaning of the hydration that re uh, reactions that actually happen we know very well that the initial set happens at the end of the dormant period and by the time of the initial set there is sufficient hydrated layers or hydrated structure formed which reduces the permeability drastically, of course porosity is also reduced significantly by that time. But what happens beyond the final set is that you get the transformation of a viscoelastic material into a rigid solid ok. So, cement paste turns from a viscoelastic nature to a rigid solid, mostly a brittle solid. Of course, you may argue that even hardened cement paste or hardened concrete has sufficiently high viscoelasticity which we will talk about later, but for the most part for the from the point of view of understanding the behavior of this uh, uh, compound in the fresh state, when final set occurs that is when it changes to a rigid solid. That is why we say that beyond final set you cannot change the dimensions of the object anymore, right. So, at that point of time, is when your strength starts increasing in the system ok. So, in other words until the final set occurs your cement paste still has what is called green strength. That means it is not strong, but it is stiff beyond setting it is stiff it is not strong ok. So, it has set, but it is not started gaining strength. So, only after final set you really have the start of the gain in strength. So, which is why uh, when you go abroad sometimes they say the concrete looks green ok, that does not mean the colour of the concrete is green that means it is not fully set yet ok. Now, today of course, we use green in different contexts, we say that sustainable things are green right, it is a green technology. So, you might have seen several papers dealing with green cement ok, I still think green cement is something that is not set because I do not know if cement can be ever green, concrete can be green, but not cement ok, because we add pigments green colored pigments to concrete ok. I will again re emphasize that reactions with the cement particles can happen in several different stages. As I said first and foremost you have the initial dissolution from the cement particles. Now, you know very well that cement particles are present in various size ranges, what is the ok, I, I did not touch upon this earlier in the cement composition thing. What is the average particle size of cement uh, cement grains? 
40 is too large. Average particle size. Yeah, about 15 microns is the average particle size of cement particles. Okay, but you know very well that not all particles of your cement clinker will be of the same size. Okay, some particles may be as much as 100 microns. Some may come all the way down to about 1 micron. There will be very few particles which are sub 1 micron. Now, what will happen is because of the size of these particles, the tendency to dissolve obviously will depend on the size of the particles. The finer the particle, the quicker will be the dissolution. Okay. So, as soon as cement comes in contact with water, the finest particles will start forming this outer hydrated structure, which is why you have this calcium hydroxide formation and so on. Okay. But when you look at the unhydrated larger or moderately large cement particles, we are talking about 20 to 40 micron or maybe even 10 to 40 micron in size, the reaction will proceed in two stages. One is obviously the dissolution, you see here, there is as soon as cement co comes in contact with water within the first 10 minutes, there is some dissolution from the particle surface. Now, what is important for you to understand is a cement clinker particle need not be just one phase, it need not be just C3A, it need not be just C3S and so on. So, here, here you see that this is actually a mixture, this cement particle is a mixture of a C3S phase and the ground mass C3A plus ferrite solid solution. So, it is marked as C3A and FSS that means ferrite solid solution not exactly marked as C4AF. Okay. The other phase is C3S. Okay. So, as soon as the cement particle, I am talking about these moderately sized cement particles 10 to 40 microns, when they come in contact with water, you have this initial dissolution which is leading to the formation of ettringite in the just outside the particle and you also have this barrier of hydrates forming just around the C3S and that is because of CSH and calcium hydroxide. Okay. So, now after about 10 hours, a sufficient amount of hydrate is actually formed here and that is because my particle is still dissolving outwards and forming the CSH which is called outer CSH. So, my particles from the surface are dissolving outwards and making outer CSH. You also are forming a substantial amount of ettringite and monosulfate phases in the outer CSH. Now, because of this, you see that you are starting to create more and more dense hydrates around the cement particle. So, beyond this what is going to happen? Your outward dissolution <coughs> may be restricted to a large extent and because of that water will have to diffuse through this hydrate layer to the inside of the cement particle and start hydrating the particle from inside and that is when you start forming inner CSH. So, look at the time scales here. So, your initial dissolution and appearance of wettering head is as early as 10 minutes. Around 10 hours you have this outer CSH formation. Around 18 hours you start seeing the wettering needles as well as conversion to monosulfate at 1 to 3 days and by about 14 days there is a large quantity of inner CSH that has started forming. So, there are two mechanisms which are happening with respect to hydration. One is a through solution reaction the other is what is called in situ reaction so through solution reaction produces what csh outer csh and the in situ reaction produces inner csh the in situ reaction is also called topochemical reaction Topo chemical that means on the surface of the product itself, not away from it. On the surface of the reactant itself, you are undergoing some changes and forming CSH. Okay. We will look at this structure in more detail in tomorrow's class. Thank you.